was there was a moo cow coming down along the road. And this moo cow that was coming down along the road met a nice and little boy named Baby Tuku. His father told him that story. His father looked at him through a glass. He had a hairy face. He was Baby Tuku. The moo cow came down the road where Betty Byrne lived. She sold lemon flat. Oh, the wild rose blossoms on the little green place. He sang that song. That was his song. On the green, mucky mucky. When you make the bed first, it is warm and it gets cold. His mother put on the oil sheet that had the queer smell. His mother had a nicer smell than his father. She played on the piano the sailor's hornpipe for him to dance. He danced. Tra la 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 la, tra la 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 di, tra la 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 la, tra la 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 la. Uncle Charles and Dante clapped. They were older than his father and mother, but Uncle Charles was older than Dante. Dante had two little brushes in her press. The brush with the maroon velvet back was for Michael Dante, and the brush with the green velvet back was for Parnell. Dante gave her the cashew every time he brought her a piece of tissue paper. The Bansons lived to look at seven. They had a different father and mother. They were Eileen's father and mother. When they were grown up, he was going to marry Eileen. He hid under the table. His mother said, Oh, Stephen will apologise. Dante said, Oh, if not, the eagles will come and pull out his eyes. Pull out his eyes, apologise, apologise. Pull out his eyes. Apologise. Pull out his eyes. Pull out his eyes. Apologise. The wide playgrounds are swarming with boys, all with shouting. Prefects urging on the strong cries. The evening air is pale and chilly, and after every charge in the pile of the footballers, the greasy leather orb flew like a heavy bird to the grey light. Out of sight, his prefect. Out of the reach of wooded feet, feigning to run now and then. He felt his body small and weak amid the throng of players, and his eyes were weak and hungry. Blood kicking was not like that. He'd be captain of the third line, the fellow said. Blood kicking was a decent fellow, but a nasty roach was a stick. Blood kicking had greaves in his number and a hamper in the refuge. Nasty roach had big hands. Paul provided with a dominant act. And one day he asked, What's your name? Stephen had answered, Stephen Douglas. Then Nancy wrote, I said, What kind of a name is that? And when Stephen had not been able to answer, Nancy wrote, he asked, What is your father? Stephen had answered, A gentleman. Then Nancy wrote, he asked, Is he a magistrate? from point to point like the fringe of his life, making little runs now and then. But his hands were blue and cold. He kept his hands and the side pockets of his belt of grey suit. And that was a belt round his pocket. And belt was also to give a fellow a belt. And one day a fellow said to Cantor, I'll give you such a belt in a second. Cantor then answered, go and fight your match. If says of coming a belt, I'd like to see you. Give you a toll or look for yourself. This was not a nice expression. His mother had told him not to speak with the rough boys in the college. Nice mother. The first day in the hall of the castle, when she had said goodbye, she had put up her veil, doubled to her nose to kiss him, and her nose and her eyes were red. But he pretended not to see that she was going to cry. She was a nice mother, but she was not so nice when she cried. And his father had given him two five shilling pieces for pocket money. And his father had told him if he wanted anything to write home to him, and whatever he did, never to teach him about. <coughs> then at the door of the castle, the rector had shaken hands with his father and mother. He sat down fluttering in the breeze. And the car had driven off with his father and mother on it. They had cried to him from the car, waving their hands. Goodbye, Stephen, goodbye. Goodbye, Stephen, goodbye. He was caught in the whirl of a scrummage, and fearful of the flashing eyes and the muddy boots, 
bent down to look through the legs. The fellows were struggling and groaning and their legs were rubbing and kicking and stamping. Then Jack Lawton's yellow boots dodged out the ball and all the other boots and legs ran after. He ran after them a little way and then stopped. It was useless to run on. Soon they'd be going home for the holidays. After supper in the study hall, he would change the number pasted up inside his desk from 77 to 76. It would be better to be in the study hall than out there in the cold. The sky was pale and cold, but there were lights in the castle. He wondered from which, which window Hamilton Rowland had thrown his hat on the ha-ha, and had there been flower beds at that time under the windows. One day when we had been called in the castle, the butler had shown him the marks of the soldiers' slugs in the wood of the door, and had given him a piece of shortbread that the community ate. It was nice and warm to see the lights in the castle. It was something like in a book. Perhaps Leicester Abbey was like that. And there were nice sentences in Dr. Cornwell's spelling book. They were like poetry, but they were only sentences to learn the spellings from. Wolsey died in Leicester Abbey, where the abbots buried him. Cancer is a disease of plants, cancer one of animals. Nice to lie in the heart before the fire, leaving his head upon his hands, and think of those same pieces. He sees them as if he had cold, slimy water next his skin. That was meal of Wales to shoulder him into the square things, because he would not swap his little snuff box for Wales's season hacking chestnut. The conqueror of Fortin. How cold and slimy the water had been. A fellow had done seen a big rat jump into the scum. Mother was sitting at the fire with Dante, waiting for Brizzy to bring the tea. She had her feet on the fender, and her jewelry slippers were so hot that they had such a lovely warm smell. Dante knew a lot of things. She had taught him where the Mozambique Channel was, and what was the longest river in America, and what was the name of the highest mountain in the moon. Father Arnal knew more than Dante, because he was a priest, but both his father and Uncle Charles said that Dante was a clever woman and a well-read woman. And when Dante made that noise after dinner, and then put up her hand to her mouth, that was a hard a voice cried far out in the playground, All in! Then other voices cried from the lower and third lines, All in! All in! The players closed the rounds, flushed and heavy, and he went on them, last to go in. Roddy Pickham held the ball by his squeezy legs. A fellow asked him to give it one last. But he walked on without even answering the fellow. Simon Boonen told me not to because the prefect was looking. The fellow turned to Simon Boonen and said, We all know why you speak. You are my plate's suck. Suck was a queer word. The fellow called Simon Boonen that name because Simon Boonen used to tie the prefect's false leaves behind his back. And the prefect used to let on to be angry. The sound was ugly. Once he had washed his hands in the lavatory of the Wicklow Hotel, and his father pulled the stopper up by the chain after, and the dirty water went down through the hole in the basin. And when it had all gone down slowly, the hole in the basin had made a sound like that suck, only louder. To remember that the white look of the lavatory made him feel cold and then hot. There were two cocks that returned and water came out, cold and hot. He felt cold and then a little hot. And he could see the names printed on the cocks. That was a very queer thing. And the air in the corridor chilled him too. It was queer and wettish. But soon the gas would be lit and in burning it made a light noise like a little song. Always the same. And when the fellows stopped talking in the playroom, you could hear it. It was the hour for sums. The father, Arnel, wrote a hard sum on the board and then said, Now then, 
Who will win? Go ahead, Lord. Go ahead, like I said. Stephen tried his best, but the sun was too hard and he felt confused. The little silk badge with a white rose on it that was pinned on the breast of his jacket began to flutter. He was not good at sums, but he tried his best so that York might not lose. Father Arnell's face, Father Arnell's face looked very black, but he was not in wax. He was laughing. Then Jack Lawton cracked his finger, fingers, and Father Arnell looked at his copybook and said, Right, bravo, next. The red rose wins. Come on, now, York, for Jack. Jack Lawton looked over from his side. The little silk badge with the red rose on it looked very rich because he had a blue sailor top on. Stephen felt his own face red too, thinking of all the best about who would get first place in elements, Jack Lawton or he. Some weeks Jack Lawton got the cards for his first, and some weeks he got the cards. Wait. Some weeks Jack Lawton got the cards for first, and some weeks he got the cards for first. Come stop. His white silk badge fluttered and fluttered and he worked at the next sum and heard Father Arnell's voice. Then all his eagerness passed away and he felt his face quite cool. He thought his face must be white because it felt so cool. He could not get out the answer for the sun, but it did not matter. White roses, red roses, those were beautiful colors to think of. And the cards for first place and second place and third place were beautiful colors too. Pink and cream and lavender. Lavender and cream and pink roses were beautiful to think. Perhaps the wild rose might be like those colors and he remembered the song about the wild rose blossoms on the little green place. But he could not have a green rose. But Perhaps somewhere in the world you could. The bell rang and then the classes began to fire out of the room and along the corridors towards the refectory. He sat looking at the two prints of butter on his plate and could not eat the damp bread. The tablecloth was damp and limp, but he drank off the hot weak tea which the clumsy scullion girl with a white apron poured into his cup. He wondered whether the scullion's apron was damp too or whether all white things were cold and damp. Nasty roach and sour and dried cocoa that their people sent them in tins. They said they could not drink the tea, that it was hogwash. Their fathers were magistrates, the fellow said. All the boys seemed to him very strange. They had old fathers and mothers and different clothes and voices. He longed to be at home and lay <coughs> his head on his mother's lap. But he could not, and so he longed for the play and study and prayers to be over and to be in bed. He drank another cup of hot tea and Fleming said, What's up? Have you a pain or what's up with you? I don't know, Stephen said. Sick in your bread basket, Fleming said, because your face looks white. It'll go away. Oh yes, Stephen said. But he was not sick there. He thought that he was sick in his heart if he could be sick in that case. Fleming was very decent to ask him. He wanted to cry. He leaned his elbows on the table and shut and opened the flaps of his ears. Then he heard the noise of the refectory every time he opened the flaps of his ears. It made a roar like a train at night. And when he closed the flaps, the roar was shut off like a train going into a tunnel. That night at Dalkin, the train had roared like that, and then, when it went into the tunnel, the roar stopped. He closed his eyes and the train went on, roaring and then stopping, roaring again, stopping. It was nice to hear it roar and stop and then roar out of the tongue again and then stop. Then the higher line fellows began to come down along the matting in the middle of the refectory. Paddy Rapp and Jimmy McGee and the Spaniard who was allowed to smoke cigars and the little Portuguese who wore the woolly cap. And then the lower line tables and the tables of the third row. Every single fellow had a different way of walking. He sat in a corner of the playroom pretending to watch a game of dominoes, and once or twice he was able to hear for an instant the little sound of the gas. The prefect was at the door with some boys, and some
Sang Lunan was not in his false knees. He was telling them something about Talbay. Then he went away from the door, and Wells came over to Stephen and said, Tell us, Douglas, do you kiss your mother before you go to bed? Stephen answered, I do. Wells turned to the other fellows and said, Oh, I say, here's a fellow who says he kisses his mother every night before he goes to bed. The other fellows stopped their game and turned around laughing. Stephen blushed under the eyes and said, I do not. Wells said, Oh, I say, here's a fellow who says he doesn't kiss his mother before he goes to bed. They all laughed again. Stephen tried to laugh with them. He felt his whole body hot and confused in the moment. What was the right answer to the question? He had given two and still Wells laughed. But Wells must know the right answer for he was the third of grammar. He tried to think of Wells' mother, but he did not dare to raise his eyes to Wells' face. He did not like Wells' face. It was Wells who had shouldered him into the square ditch the day before because he would not swap his little snuff box for Wells' seasoned hack of chestnut, the conqueror of 40. It was a mean thing to do, all the fellows said it was. And how cold and slimy the water had been. And the fellow had once seen a big rat jump plop into the scum. The cold slime of the ditch covered his whole body, and when the bell rang for study and the lines filed out of the playrooms, he felt the cold air of the corridor and the staircase inside his clothes. He still tried to think, what was the right answer? Was it right to kiss his mother or wrong to kiss his mother? What did that mean to kiss? You put your face up like that to say goodnight, and then his mother put her face down. That was to kiss. His mother put his, her lips on his cheek. Her lips were soft and they wetted his cheek and they made a tiny little noise. Kiss. Why do people do that with their two faces? Sitting in the study hall, he opened the lid of his desk and changed the number pasted up inside from 77 to 76. But the Christmas vacation was very far away. But one time it would come because the earth moved around always. There was a picture of the earth on the first page of his journal. Thank <laughs> you. 
those praying. But though there were different names for God in all the different languages in the world, God understood what all the people who prayed said in their different languages. Still, God remained always the same. God, and God's real name, was God. It made him very tired to think that way. It made him feel his head very big. He turned over the flyleaf and looked wearily at the green round earth in the middle of the maroon clouds. He wondered which was right, to be for the green or for the maroon, because Dante had ripped the green velvet back off the brush that was for Parnell one day with her scissors and had told him that Parnell was a bad man. He wondered if they were arguing about it at home. That was called politics. There were two sides in it. Dante was one side and his father and Mr Casey were on the other side. But his mother and Uncle Charles were on no side. Every day there was something in the paper about it.
told me that this leader is to hurry up. He had to undress and then kneel beside his own prayers and be in bed before the gas lower so that he might not go to hell when he died. He rolled the stockings off and put on his nightshirt quickly and knelt trembling at his bedside and repeated his prayers quickly, fearing that the gas would go in. He felt his shoulders shaking as he murmured, God bless my father and mother and spare them to me. God bless my little brothers and sisters and spare them to me. God bless Dante and Uncle Charles and spare them to me. He blessed himself and climbed quickly into bed and, tucking the end of the nightshirt under his feet, curled himself together under the cold light sheets, shaking and trembling. But he would not go to hell when he died, and the shaking would stop. A voice bade the boys in the dormitory good night. He peered out for an instant over the coverlet and saw the yellow curtains round and before his bed that showed him off on all sides. The light was low and quiet. Well